Good morning. Good to see you. You've heard that verse, uh, many are called and few are chosen. Uh, this morning it's more like many are cold and few are frozen. I think it's a, a bit chilly out there, but a uh, better day tomorrow as I understand it. And it's a joy to see each of you here once again. We've been working through some verses in the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bible, please turn there to chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We've uh, already expressed the fact that as you examine the book of Philippians, it has a lot to say about attitudes. It has a lot to say about the way we think, our minds. And uh, we see in each and every chapter that particular topic being touched upon. And as we look here, we have the God-given ability, according to what Paul reveals to us here, to think about the kinds of things that, that build up and strengthen and encourage one another. As we come together as the body of Christ week by week, part of the, uh, part of the purpose for which we come together is to do that very thing, that we might build up one another through the ministry of encouragement. We live in a world, as you well know, that's full of uh, discouraging things, disinformation, and it's a welcomed uh, sight to be able to encounter at least uh, once or twice a week people who perhaps uh, think a little differently. Um, Paul uh, was able to do this throughout the entirety of the book, and keep in mind, in Philippians, where was he? Help me out there. Where was he writing this epistle from? Prison. And yet we find him saying so many things that are, are so enlightening, so uplifting, so encouraging. We saw it in chapter 1. I'm confident, he says, of the very thing, that, that the one who has begun the good work in you will, will see that work uh, done unto its completion when Christ returns. And, and uh, as we look here, it's as if the Apostle Paul sort of writes in such a way that he sort of has the end in view. Uh, as he writes and as he shares uh, thoughts and, and truth with us, uh, that seems to be the case. For example, in chapter 3, we didn't examine this last time, though we were uh, focused in chapter 2 last week together, uh, Paul makes this an astounding statement that helps us understand that, you know, this, this is not our final resting place here. If you are a child of God, you're a citizen of heaven, and uh, in time, you and I will will have a building from God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And so he speaks about our citizenship in chapter 3, verse 20. And the thing that we also note, we'll see it in our text here today as well, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul was living with this confident expectation of the imminent or soon return of Jesus Christ for his people. And as we see chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we see this reiterated yet again here in this text. Notice what it says there, verse 24, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again, in that sense is what he is saying. Now what's he going to do when he comes? He will transform our bodies of our humble estate into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So in a sense, uh, we're resident aliens upon this earth when you think about it because our citizenship is in heaven. And so as Paul writes here, he does so. He says, you need to think about life. And as you encounter perhaps uh, bumps along the way and challenges in your life, uh, think in terms of, of, of thinking with, with the end in view. The fact that you are a celestial citizen, the fact that you do have a home in heaven, and that seemed to really bring uh, a great deal of comfort to Paul as he writes to those believers back in Philippi. Always remember this, your current situation is not your final destination. The best is yet to come. Let me repeat that. If you're taking notes, perhaps uh, I write in my Bible. I hope you do too. It's got a lot of writing all through it. But uh, again, another thing that perhaps we want to tuck away, remember this. Your current situation is not your final destination. Get this, the best is yet to come. So Paul writes from that vantage point. He thinks from that vantage point, and uh, we see this so beautifully uh, 
really sprinkled throughout the entirety of the book of Philippians. Again, Paul has this wonderful outlook, this wonderful attitude in some rather uh, dark, dismal circumstances. And again, uh, he wants us to maintain the same kind of balance and perspective that he himself was able to maintain in a, in a world that was filled with uh, certainly its own challenges. Begin with the end in view. Back in 1899, two men died at the same year, one by the name of Robert Ingersoll. He was an atheist. He did his best to discredit Christianity. He attacked uh, the preachers of that day. He made it his life calling to somehow or another discredit the scriptures and try to pe have people doubt the validity of the Christian faith. So he died and his decaying body was kept in his home for many, many days. Finally, it was removed. The corpse was removed because it was beginning to endanger the health of the rest of his family members. And so that, that body, that decaying body was finally taken to a crematorium and, and newscasters, I guess you'd call them uh, newspaper writers back in that day, were coming from all around the country to witness and observe what would take place. National news Newspapers carried uh, stories about uh, his cremation. And here are some of the things that were mentioned. Uh, there was no hope. No mentioning of a future, no thought of a reunion or a gathering in the future. Only darkness and despair, the absence of hope, death. That same year, D.L. Moody passed away. And his death, in contrast to that, was triumphant. For not only Moody himself, but also for his entire family. On the Moody's, uh, morning of Moody's death, his son, by the name of William, wrote down these words. Dion Moody said, Earth is rescinding. Heaven is opening. God is calling. Will spoke up to his father and said, Dad, you are dreaming. You are dreaming. Oh, no, I am not dreaming. This is no dream. I've been within the gates. I see the children's faces. Moody was uh, moving from, from being in and out and began to slip away. And then he said these words. Is this death? He asked. This is not bad. This is not a valley. This is bliss with, with, with glory. By the time uh, Moody's daughter Emma came in, she began to pray for his recovery. Moody spoke up at that point and said, Oh, dear Emma, don't pray for that. God is calling. This is my coronation day. I've been looking to this the entirety of my life. And shortly thereafter, Moody was welcomed into the warm embrace of his Savior, Jesus Christ. At the funeral, these words were proclaimed. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, the victory over sin, death, and the grave through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Moody's death was a victory. So as uh, Paul lived his life, Moody lived it in a very similar manner, uh, we must kind of keep in mind the end in view. In other words, understand that your current situation is not your final destination, but rather uh, the, the, the best for all of us who know and love Jesus Christ, the best is yet to come. Now in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul begins to again help us with the way we think. Remember chapter 2, last time together we looked at Paul's instruction there. He's very clear. He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And we were able to discover that that involves a humility of thinking and a humility of mind, not thinking of your, less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And in that chapter, chapter 2, he says these words, let each one of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, when you think about your interaction with people this past week, do these verses in any way describe your interactions with others? Not looking out merely for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude. Now, that's a present tense verb form, which means day in and day out, hour in and hour out. Have this kind of mindset that Christ had in terms of living with people on the horizontal plane. 
Now here in chapter four, uh, Paul also addresses things pertaining to the way we think. And he starts out in chapter four, verse five, with what I referred to as practical things. Practical things. And then secondly, in verses six and seven, he, he speaks of prayerful things, helping us understand how we can combat uh, anxiety and fear in our lives. And then lastly, we find him talking about our mind in particular in terms of purifying things, things that will help us uh, really maintain a purity of heart and mind and thought. And so that's what we see in chapter 4, verse 8. But notice here uh, what he says in terms of practical things. And in essence, he's saying live in terms of anticipation. Now, believers, as believers, we are equipped to live, to respond, to react differently because in Christ you are different. And so Paul says here very uh, beautifully, simply, if you will, not hard to understand, let your gentleness or forbearing spirit be made known to, to all men. You mean to men who disagree with me or to people that perhaps don't even like me it speaks of, of a sense of contentment with generosity toward others it's a graciousness a, a humility if you will sprinkled with a little bit of compassion those those kinds of words get close to what it is that the apostle paul is calling us to let your gentleness your reasonableness, your kindness be made known to all men the word here translated uh, forbearance has the idea of being reasonable with one another, a sweet reasonableness with one another. You know, Paul says over in Colossians chapter 4, when we speak, he says, let your speech be with grace, a sweet reasonableness, seasoned with salt, that you might know how to respond to one another. So he is calling us to the very same thing here. He's saying when it comes to relating to other people, let your gentleness, your forbearing spirit be made known to all men. Now there's a verse over in uh, Romans chapter 12. I'll, I'll turn there real quick, see if I can locate it, uh, that kind of complements what, what the Apostle Paul is saying. Uh, chapter 12. Now, the book of Romans, is that in the New Testament or the Old? Did somebody help me here? One of those senior moments. I had a senior moment upon graduation from high school, but this is a different kind of senior moment. Notice with me chapter 12 here. What does Paul say? Well, he has a lot to say in chapter 12. There's, there's no question. Uh, he says... Um, these words, bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep, be of the same mind one to another. Uh, never pay back evil for evil, respect what is right in the sight of all men. Here's what I'm looking for. If possible, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. That's the idea that Paul, Paul really is saying, in essence, as we look to chapter 4, verse 5, here in the book of Philippian, Philippians. So practically what? Live in terms of anticipation. Now, why is this so important? He says, the Lord is at hand, Paul says. That's the reminder. The Lord is at hand. Live graciously. Why? Because Christ can return at any given moment. We should live in light of the imminent return of Christ. The other idea is this. Nothing escapes his hearing. Nothing escapes his sight. Therefore, practice the presence of Christ. Paul says in Titus chapter 2, looking to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He constantly lived in light as if Christ might return within the very day wherein he was living. Practical things live in terms of of anticipation. Do you live in terms of an anticipation of the soon return of Christ? We certainly are encouraged to do so repeatedly throughout the entirety of the New Testament. He's coming again. I think maybe I've told you the story, maybe I haven't. Charles uh, Swindoll worked with a fellow, I think his name was Bubba, in Texas, in Houston, Texas, before he went to seminary. And he worked in a in a machine shop, I believe it was, and 
And this guy had this uncanny ability to just know when to clean up just before the whistle would blow to close out the day, to close out uh, that particular work uh, shift. And so this guy, about three or four minutes before the whistle would blow, he'd be over there kind of putting his tools away and straightening up his work area. And, and finally, Swindoll asked him one day, he said, uh, Bubba, how is it that you just know that, that, that uh, when, when you're supposed to get ready, how do you know when that is? He says, listen, I like it like this. He says, I, I stay ready so I don't have to get ready. And that's how we should be. He is saying here very simply, very, very beautifully, uh, let your gentleness, your forbearing spirit be made known unto all men because, because the Lord is, is near. In other words, stay ready so you don't have to spend time getting ready. Secondly here, he moves from practical things to to prayerful things. And here he says, when it comes to life and some of the challenges and difficulties in life, he's saying, listen, respond in terms of supplication. Respond in terms of supplication. Prayerful things. Look at it with me, picking it up in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, that seems to include everything, right? All things. By prayer and supplication, which it means to supply, in other words, Lord, supply this need. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Tom Landry was one of the greatest NFL coaches of all time. Not only one of the greatest, one of the winningest coaches, but one of the calmest. Do you remember watching Landry? You from my age, you remember him walking the sideline always dressed to the nines and, you know, certainly calm. Somebody had asked him, well, how is it that you deal with this kind of thing? He said these words. He said, most of the athletes fail to become winners are those athletes who, whose fears and anxieties prevent them from reaching their potential. I overcame my fears and anxieties by a commitment to something greater than winning a football game, a commitment to Jesus Christ. Now look at verse uh, 6 here. It reveals the problem. What's the problem? Worry. Notice what he says here. Be anxious for nothing. The word uh, translated anxious means uh, worry or fear. Uh, it's a burden. It's a trouble. It's something that's uh, literally the word means to be pulled apart. And that's exactly the nature of what anxiety does. If you allow anxiety to camp in your uh, mental space long enough, if it's uh, entertained long enough, it has the ability to literally pull you apart emotionally. It means to be divided, distracted. Worry attacks you who, as to who you are. It, it divides your, your abilities to focus on the things you ought to be doing. It also has a way, the Bible says, of eroding the promises of God from our minds, erasing the promises of God from our mind. The cares of this life choke out, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, the, the things that God has promised to us. Now, the scriptures reveal the problem, and we all acknowledge it if we're honest. I mean, uh, the scriptures make, make it clear that it is a problem. Personal experience also makes it clear it's a problem. If you talk to anybody this week or this past month, undoubtedly that fellow believer would say, yes, it's something that I struggle with. Personal experience tells us it's something that we all struggle with. Now, this is something very important to perhaps take note of. I've got uh, statistics, but I'm just going to give you the basic statistic. 88%, listen to this, 88% of, of the things that we typically worry about, listen, never occur. 88%. Only 12% of the things that sort of cross our mind and perhaps cause us concern are of a legitimate nature. So that's the problem. So, so how do we address the problem? We address the problem with the prescription. Paul says these words, don't worry about anything, but big uh, contrast here. Uh, it, I think it's the Greek word. There's two words for but in the original language. One is sort of just a regular like transition, but this one is kind of big. It's saying, listen, 
Don't allow this to swallow you up. But in contrast, he says here, in everything, in everything you encounter by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Let me repeat that. Prayer is that slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Charles uh, Samuel Chadwick said these words. The one concern of the devil is to keep his saints from praying. That is God's saints. He fears, he, he fears nothing from prayerless studies. He fears nothing from prayerless work. He fears nothing from prayerless religion. He laughs at our toils. He mocks at our wisdom. But Satan trembles, trembles when we pray. Think about that. Why? Because he knows, he's read the book, he knows just as much as we should know, that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. Accomplishes much. Now he goes on here. He reveals the problem. What is it? Worry. Don't worry about anything. The prescription. Pray about everything. And then he gives us this wonderful promise. Hopefully you've experienced it in your life. I have at different junctures in my life. He's saying if we do this, if we place those things at the foot of the cross, here's what will take place if we leave them there. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, comprehension, shall garrison or guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Bible has a lot to say about peace with God. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you've never responded to the gospel. The Bible says this, you must experience peace with God before you're able to experience the peace of God. They're two different things. Peace with God has the idea that when we place our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are legally declared righteous in God's sight. Our sins and rebellion is removed by the redemption of Christ. Key verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, which says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Wonderful thing to be at peace with God, isn't it? I don't know if you remember what it was like to be estranged from God or separated from God. I do as a teenager. It wasn't until I was nearly 18 years of age that those things were forever settled as I received the Lord Jesus as my Savior and Lord. But I have peace with God, and I trust that all of us who are assembled here today have peace with God. That's a key thing, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a little different. He's talking about the peace of God. What's that? It's that inner calm and tranquility that comes from a praying heart. We see it here, verses 6, as well as verse 7. It's that, that unwavering confidence that, that God is able and He will do what is best for His children. He will do what is best for His children. Are you His child today? I trust that you are. Very simple thing. Romans, uh, excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, that is Christ, he gives the right, the power, the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Verse 6 says, pray about everything. And then he gives this promise, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And when it comes to worry, what's the culprit? What's the thing that's so vulnerable? It's the mind. His peace will garrison or guard our minds. That's where the problem is. The mind is where worry seeks to do its work of undoing us, making us unfit to live uh, in a normal kind of way, introducing anxiety and instability into our world. But Paul says, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. And if you do this as instructed, God's peace will guard your hearts and your minds. 
prayerful things. Respond in terms of supplication. Third key thing we'd like to see here uh, this morning is this, purifying things. And this point is where we get into the realm of our thinking and our mind. And as I mentioned earlier, each and every chapter here, the Apostle Paul has something very specific to say in regards to our thinking, in regards to our mind. Last time together, we talked about the importance of, of realigning our thoughts because we were constantly bombarded from all kinds of different angles and sources and, and, and you know, media screens or whatever. We're constantly being bombarded to change our mind and to weaken our mind and to uh, compromise uh, something in terms of the way in which we think. Now, I was reading a commentary here um, this past week on this passage. It was written by a man in 1973. And uh, he said back then, and I can't imagine what it is today, but he said the average individual back in 1973 would be bombarded with 1,500 advertisements on a given day. Now, we have uh, handheld devices. We have several monitors through our home. We have radio. We have all kinds of media outlets. I'm sure that we're being bombarded even more. The problem is this, if you and I hear something often enough and see something often enough, our mind will eventually begin to embrace the message. So Paul says here, there's a battle for your mind. And, and the great area of sin isn't merely just your actions, but, but a lot of times it's a battle for the mind. It's in the area of our thoughts. And so, so Paul is saying, listen, as we think about what it is that we're thinking about or seeing or, 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 or scrolling through, here's a real good uh, grid, if you will, or a sieve through which to move in the direction of having thoughts that are transformed thoughts, thoughts that would bring honor and glory to our Savior, things that would build us up rather than tear us down or bring us to a place of compromise. With that in mind, let's see what he's talking about. He is saying, listen, Let's think in terms of purity of thought and mind. Uh, think in terms of transformation. What are the questions then we must ask ourselves to get to that point in our life and in our thinking in particular? Whatsoever, notice it with me, verse 8. My brethren, whatsoever things are true. Whatever it is needs to be based upon truth consistent with truth, an ally of the truth, or else it's something less than truth. Is it dishonest? Is it untested? Is it unreliable? So the, the grid or the guideline as we think about the thoughts that we welcome into our minds and entertain must pass through the sieve of the simple question, is it true? Now what does the Bible say about truth? Jesus said these words, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. If you want liberation in life, you want freedom in life, you want to be able to live the way in which you should be able to live, it's going to be on the basis of renewing your mind with the truth of God's Word. That's why Paul says over in Romans chapter 12, don't allow this world to constantly squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, asking questions like, is it true? Now, we live in a society today and have been for some time where, where ethical relativis, relativism has, has been in the uh, in the scene and in the conversation and, and you know it, it sort of skewed things no longer do we know is this moral or is it not moral is this truth or is it error is it good is it bad so those things are being blurred to the point where they're being redefined as well as renamed and so Paul says listen focus your mind upon what is true is it true is it ethical, biblical truth? Renew your mind with the truth of God's Word, and you will have the promise as well as the prospect of freedom in your life. Does my thought that I'm giving 
thought too? Is it distorted? Does it ring true? Is there distortion? If there's distortion, there will be dissonance in my life. Second question is this, is it noble? That's a word we don't use too often today. That's the idea of honesty. Whatever is honest, dignified, or that which is promoted by godlike morals and motives. Is it noble? Is it true? Is it noble? Thirdly, is it right? Notice it with me, verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right. Listen to this carefully. Right is right and wrong is wrong. There's never ever a way to do a right thing that is wrong. Let me say it one more time. Right is right, wrong is wrong. There's never a right way to do a wrong thing. It's never right to lie. You say, what about Rahab? She was never, ever commended on the fact that she lied. She, she commended on the fact that she had faith that, that the spies communicated the truth to her. She's commended for that, but never, ever for her lying. It's never right to lie. It's not right to cheat. It's not right to steal. It's not right to undermine. You and I are in vital union with Jesus Christ. We are to think rightly. We're never to make decisions on the basis of what is quick or expedient or the fastest, but rather on the basis of what's right. How many of you shop at Giant Eagle? There's a few of you here. Where do you shop down here typically? Sam's Club, Aldi, Aldi's a good place, yeah. Yeah, let's imagine this, it's hypothetical. And I, you know, I, when I moved to Pittsburgh a long time ago, I, Giant Eagle just doesn't seem like a grocery store name for me. But anyhow, that's where we shop some. I'd think of that as being maybe like a place where you buy a big pet, Giant Eagle. I, anyhow, you go to Giant Eagle and, and the poor gal, it's, it's kind of getting toward the end of her shift and, and she's just kind of tired and she gives you back change and rather than presenting you with a single dollar bill, which you're entitled to, she gives you back a 10, okay? You're thinking as you walk out the door, it's like, mm, this isn't a one, this is a 10. My lucky day, right? Just hit the lottery. Ah, Giant Eagle, big corporation. They're not going to miss nine dollars. Little do you know. I, I, some of you probably do know that at the end of the day, she has to go to her register and have her register reconcile with the register's tape, right? And there's got to be a matching up. Otherwise, she's going to be probably put on probation. Or if it's happened more than once, she may very well lose her job. Focus, listen, focus your thoughts carefully upon what is right. What's right in that situation? I think you know the answer to that question. Notice fourthly here, whatsoever things are pure. Advertisers have learned techniques to create images and languages that seek to arouse the baser side of our human life and depravity. So we need to ask ourselves, is this thing discreet? Is it something that I am really discerning? Or, or is this thought fitting with who I am in Christ? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Devour. He wants to take advantage of us in any situation possible. He knows if he can make an inroad into our mind, sort of cultivate some carnal curiosity, it's just a matter of time before that which has been pure becomes impure. Paul says we are to take, listen, this is a very convicting verse, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? 
That means we use the sieve. That means we use the grid. That means we say, is, is it truthful and is it noble and is it right and is it pure? So we sift our thoughts through the sieve, asking these very pointed questions. Next, whatsoever is lovely. That has the idea of things that are kind and gracious, things that promote brotherly love. Last on the list, what does he say? Whatever things are of good report. Paul says, listen, don't just satisfy yourself with the good. Think in terms of, of the better and, and the best and the excellent. Rejection of the inferior and the base. Focus upon that which is positive and constructive instead of negative and defensive. So go through it with me one more time. Whatsoever things are what? True. Whatsoever things are noble. Whatsoever things are right or just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report feed your mind on these things in other words focus your thoughts carefully secondly feed your mind correctly think on these things these virtues again this serves as a great grid a filtering grid for our lives that we might see a purifying effect upon our life. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, when we uh, submit ourselves to the word of God, it has that purifying effect upon our lives. Solomon said these words 3,000 years ago, For as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. Someone said these words, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Let me say it one more time. What you think you, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Change will be the result of responding to the truth of God's word by the enabling work of the spirit of God in our life. Notice lastly, if we could put it up on the screen, this little uh, thing I had come across many years ago, but it's so true, so very true. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Think on these things. Would you bow with me as we pray? Let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men, for the Lord is near. Be, gracious, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are right and pure and lovely and of good report, if there be any excellence, if there be anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell, dwell on these things. Well, friend, we appreciate uh, you listening today, and hopefully these things will be of great help to us as we give attention to our thoughts. It's an everyday thing. It's an every hour thing. It's not something you, you sort of do on Monday and get things kind of squared up and it's going to carry you through the rest of the week. No, it's a constant renewing of the mind, asking those hard questions. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it pleasing? Is it lovely? Constantly asking those good questions to bring purity of thought, which, you know, we think about thoughts. Thoughts give way to behavior. Good thoughts give way to good behavior. Good behavior gives way to good feelings. And that's how we can be at peace with ourselves. Lord, I thank you for these, your people today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and to look into your word. And Lord, the work of transformation is a work that you do by your Holy Spirit. We cooperate by listening and seeking to apply your word, but we know, Lord, that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we admit our need of you. We admit our need of the Holy Spirit as we move in the direction of change. We would love to see you work in our lives to bring about change so that we might reflect more of the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
We thank you, Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his death upon the cross, his burial and resurrection. And we thank you, Father, that through simple faith and trust in him, we receive the gift of eternal life. And we would pray, Lord, that if there's someone here today who does not know Christ, that this would be their day of days where they would come to know him as Savior and Lord. We thank you again, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.